Hello and welcome. If you're just signing on, we are going to get started in a few minutes here with Succeeding with Novels in a World Language class. I'm Brian. Uh, we're just going to give a couple minutes. I see attendees are pouring in. You must have been waiting right away. As we go through, if you have questions, there's a Q&A uh, section there. There's also a chat if you want to chat with other attendees or with me. Um, I'm not sure how much I'll be able to get to the chat, but the questions I'll try to get to as we go through if we get a chance, or at least at the end, I'll try to answer questions. So again, we're going to give it a few minutes before we start here. Um, oh, there we go. Aaron put something in the chat about posting questions. Sounds like we have a lot of attendees on Zoom and then even more on Facebook. I'm excited to get started here. I guess if you're here already, maybe maybe let me know if you can hear me real quick on the chat. Can you hear me? We tested it and everything was running smoothly, so I think you can hear me. Yes, you can. Says Gina and Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Loud and clear. Cool. Alrighty. Good afternoon, Terry. I have concluding our parent teacher conferences and evening. Terry, thanks for coming and supporting your students' education. If you have any further questions for your students' teachers, please email them and they will be happy to get back to you. Thank you and have a great night. I don't know if you can hear that in the background, but this is we actually had parent teacher conferences tonight, which just ended, so they were making an announcement about that. Hey Ellen. Good. We have some people from Ohio here, probably from all over. The chat is too fun. I have to make sure I don't get <laughs> don't get distracted by the uh, chat for the presentation. Oh, so the people on Facebook can see the little video. So you can see me in the video and hear me. And we are now recording. So I'm good to get started. And I'm sure some people will, will sign on a little later and that's fine. But we are just about ready to get started here. Um, Again, if you're just joining us, uh, there is a question and answer uh, section, Q&A section here on Zoom uh, for you to add or ask some questions. I'll try to maybe get to them during the presentation or at the end, I'll try to answer them. And I will, it's, it's eight o'clock here, uh, Eastern time. Just got done with parent-teacher conferences. It's been a long day. It's pretty much bedtime as for a bunch of us here on the East. So um, won't go too long here. We'll try to keep this to an hour or so, maybe a little under an hour and leave some time for questions and answers at the end. And um, yeah, so let's get started. Oops. Well, that's not good. I think I need to click on that. There we go. Okay. So I'm Brian. I'm glad to be with you for the second time for one of these CI savvy webinars. Um, appreciate Aaron and Chuck and those at Voces for setting these up. And I'm excited to, to begin talking about succeeding with novels in the world language classroom. I'm actually going to think I need that. Um, so let's get started. So uh, I'm Brian again, and there's an email address there, which you'll see later. If you have questions, you can send them to me later on. You can also email Aaron. You can participate in the chat and the Q&A as we go through here. Welcome. And 
let's get started. This was the uh, write-up that we had. Reading is an essential source of input in world language classes. However, engaging students in the reading process, especially when reading novels, can be a challenge. As we know, not all students like to read. Most students don't like to read in language because it, it's difficult and it's hard to get them engaged. So we're going to try to find out how do we provide novels. And we're going to try to focus on novels uh, today. We've done, I've done this workshop. I've done this workshop as like a five hour workshop before with a lot of different exercises and, and reading. But today we're going to focus on just novels and some of the exercises and things I cut out so we can keep this again short. How do we expand a novel into a discussion in a target language? And how do we create classroom culture in which reading is accepted and enjoyed? So we're going to look at the importance of healthy classroom culture, how to select and create compelling texts, mostly select because we're talking about novels, how to make those texts comprehensible, how to vary the delivery, and then we'll look at some extra strategies for engagement and assessment. How do we know that reading is effective in our classes? Well, we have research. Um, you can click on that link and see the research that Dr. Krashen has done, which is extensive. We also know from our experience that when our students read, they grow their skills. We, we love to provide input for our students. We do that by talking and showing the video and audio, but also by reading. When they read, they grow because they have input. A couple of things before we get started. Uh, I think we don't adequately promote reading until we truly believe in the power of reading. I think we really, because it's difficult, because it's a challenge, we really don't promote it well until we really believe in the power and how much reading can really help our students grow. Also, I think if reading doesn't make our students better, we need to examine our definition of better. And this comes down a lot of times to assessment. If we spend a lot of time with reading and input in class, and then we try to assess our students based solely on vocabulary or grammar or structures, uh, there's a disconnect there. So if we're going to use reading, we need to assess uh, with reading and with other things that, that uh, are results of students reading. So that's just kind of uh, the setup of our classes. The last webinar I did was entirely on classroom culture, and I think that's probably still available if you want to watch that. But I do want to touch, touch very quickly on the importance of classroom culture because, again, nothing works if we don't have a healthy culture in our classrooms. And we looked at all these things in that webinar about what a healthy classroom culture looks like. And I want to revisit this one here. Number seven on this list says, students understand that everything has a purpose. And if I can open this document. This is something that we do near the end of the first quarter in Spanish 3. It's also something we revisit other times in my classes. But this kind of emphasizes the importance of everything we do in class, but especially reading. And we look at this, it's in English. The students fill this out themselves as a self-assessment. And it says your grade in Spanish is not a result of the task you complete. We have to get students to understand that your success and your grade is not the result of the homework that you did or the tasks that you completed like it might be in other classes, but it's a result of your skills. And if you wanna grow your skills, you need to understand that everything we do in class has a purpose. And I put this little silly conversation on there because we get these questions all the time. How do I improve my grade? Which when students say that, they're really saying, what can I do to earn more points? And we, and I respond with, you get better at Spanish, which is kind of funny for them. Well, how do I get better at Spanish? And then I remind them that everything we do in class is designed for you to improve your skills. So then they go through and they fill this in. How often do they do these things? And a lot of these, you'll see evidence of reading. When we listen to a song, I follow along every word, which really is reading. We listen to songs or we read them. When we read something in class, I follow along. Um, Video homework sometimes have reading. When we do an activity in class, I focus on it. I read extra outside of class. There's some speaking things here. Um, trivia questions have a lot of reading in them, so I try to understand the entire description. When we read individually, I do my best to understand. So it, hopefully students are seeing that those actions result in an improvement in skills and a better grade. At the bottom here, I put this note too. If you feel like you're still struggling, you feel like you're, you're not getting better at the language, you feel behind, read, 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 to again emphasize the importance of reading for growing those skills. So that's just something in culture that is important to have in place before we start reading. 
Uh, another thing that's important before we start here is that we need to value and practice and promote reading in our classes. One thing that I do when I do my lesson plans every week is I use this form. And it's blank here, but I put, and it's pretty simple. You may have a more complex lesson plan form, but you know, dates and the activities that we're going to do every week. And then on the right, I have these four columns, LRWS, which is obviously listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And so this is a reminder for myself every week as I'm making plans that I want to have significant listening, reading, writing, and speaking throughout the week. Listening is, is filled in with an X almost every day because students are going to do a lot of listening every day. It's input. Uh, speaking maybe once or twice a week, and this is beyond just answering cor uh, choral questions in class. This is significant speaking and writing, maybe one or two writing, maybe one, two speaking. Reading, I really want to see probably three, two, three, maybe four times a week that we're going to do significant reading. So I want to look at this as I create my plans and make sure I'm marking this. And if I see that I'm not, then I know I need to go back here and include some more things where reading happens. So again, that just keeps me on top of how often we're reading. So there are three keys to success when reading novels. And this is really our keys to success when reading in general. But again, tonight, we're going to focus on novels, compelling texts, comprehensible texts, and varied delivery, how we, how we read in class. First one, compelling texts. Uh, we, have to, we have to select texts. We have to select novels that are compelling and interesting for our students. I have this fish on here because there was it wasn't a novel but there was this reading we used to have to do for the one class and it was about trout farming in Bolivia and maybe that's interesting to you um, and I'm sorry if that's is interesting to you or you wrote it or whatever but it just wasn't compelling and it wasn't interesting to students and it was very difficult to get them to engage in that reading because it was about trout farming in Bolivia. We don't have time for texts that don't engage our students. Here's some of the dangers of boring text. Number one, students do not make an effort to comprehend and thus do not grow. They have to comprehend. The, the, the input, the reading has to be comprehensible. If it's not, we're wasting time. We're spending time reading and they're not growing because they're not trying to understand it because they really, really don't like it. Two, students disengage even further from reading at all. Um, and they you know, as I said early on, a lot of students don't like reading. They come to class and, and reading's not their thing, especially in Spanish. And, and so they're just going to even further disengage and, and separate themselves from reading at all. And then three is that students don't take our classes. And for me, I teach Spanish three and four and five, which are very much elective classes. And this runs through a lot of what I do. It has to be compelling. It has to be interesting, not just fun, but it has to be valuable. For students because if not then they're not going to take Spanish 3 and 4 and 5 because nobody tells them they have to and I mean some look for an honors degree or whatever but you, most of the students that take those classes have to want to be there in fact I often have those classes the first mod of the day or the last mod of the day where students have an option to come to school late or leave early so Spanish taking Spanish has to be more valuable to them than sleeping in and so for me Things have to be compelling, they have to be valuable, students have to see the value in them, so especially with reading. Along those lines, a lot of times I get questions about, well, how do I make my students read? How do I hold them accountable for what they read? Which is a good question. However, I think a more important question is, how do I get my students to want to read and want to engage in reading? And compelling text is one of the ways we do that. Compelling novels, we make them read. This is a lot easier than trying to hold them accountable to something they don't want to read. We can try to make them want to read, which again is not easy, but we need to work towards that. Now, compelling texts contain humor. Now, the thing about humor and novels, because I know from writing novels, it's difficult to write funny novels. And, and there are some, but th there aren't a lot because what's funny to my class is not necessary, necessarily funny to your class. And what's funny this year is not necessarily funny two or three years from now. And so it's kind of difficult to find humorous novels. There, you can find and create humorous texts that are not novels, but, um, that, but that is something very compelling to students if you can find it. Relevance, if it's important, if the main characters of the novel are the same age as the students reading, that helps. If the themes are relevant and important, 
that helps. And a lot of times those are the, some of the newer novels. Um, it's tough for high school students to read about a 11 or 12 year old protagonist. It's tough for middle school students to read about adults. So relevant themes and characters, unexpected, incredible details it is engaging to students. And then debate, things that are debatable, controversial, where some students will take one side and other students will take a different side. I have an example here from this book that is a book that I wrote called Los Sobrevivientes, which is available on through Voces Digital. And I would like to read for you a little excerpt of this book. And I'll just translate it to English. And it's just a short little excerpt. Let me read this for you. Nando tried to cheer up his friends, saying that they should not lose hope and that they would find another way to survive. They had to keep living to get back to their families in Uruguay. It was evident that it was difficult for the others to trust Nando. They were exhausted and there was no hope or life in their, in their eyes. One man that was named Carlitos grabbed Nando and took him out of the group to talk with him alone. There's no food, said Carlitos. What, said Nando? We've eaten all the chocolate and I've looked through the rest of the plain, nothing. There's nothing, there's nothing in the mountains, not a branch of a tree, not a bird, nothing. Nando thought for a second and asked, and the pilot? The pilot, said Carlitos, he's dead. He can't help us for anything. Yes, he can help us, said Nando. How? We can eat him. So <laughs> that's not funny, right? But there's a debate. And this, this book, if you're a middle school or, or lower school teacher, I, don't, I would not recommend this book. But there's a debate that we can get into in our class. And this book is about, it's based on the true story of the, the rugby team from Uruguay that, that had to eat the dead members of their team to survive for 70 days in the, in the mountains. And so we have this debate in class of whether or not you would do that. Would you eat the, the dead flesh of your friends who had passed away? Which again is not funny, but it's, it's engaging because there's a debate and there's a lot of students who will defend their point on that. So that makes something compelling. Now, how do we know, if we're talking about novels and we're not talking so much about something that we create, but we're talking about novels that exist, how do we know if a text is compelling? There are two keys. One is that we must spend time previewing text. And I know I've been guilty of this with novels and with other texts where I, I may give it to students before I've really taken the time to read it myself and understand it and see it through their eyes. So we have to do that as much as we can, spend time previewing text. And then number two, we must know our students. We need to, through everything we do in class, we need to know what is interesting to them, where they are, what they're doing, and those type of things. So spend time previewing text and know our students to try to select novels that are compelling. Now, what if I don't have a choice about what my students read? What if my department has selected a novel or this happens a lot. What if I have 35 copies of one book and I don't have 35 copies of any other book? So that's the book we're going to read. That's a great question. That, that's, that happens a lot. What can you do if you don't have a choice about what your students read? Number one is uh, fight the good fight with leadership. Keep talking to your administration, your principals, to get them to understand the value of reading and compelling text and, and whatever you can do to, to get texts that are compelling. Uh, number two, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit in uh, ahead here, but adapt, edit, skip, and summarize some sections. Uh, it's a novel, you can't necessarily, it might seem like you can't adapt it and edit, but maybe you take a small section of that novel and you type it up and you, and you write in the definitions or you adapt it or edit it a little bit. Um, or you take, and we'll talk about this again later too, but what, maybe you take some parts and you, and you don't read chapters 13 and 14 and 15, you just kind of summarize them. And so you can move on to chapter 16 and 17. Um, and with this, by the way, I, I'm, I'm not talking about making illegal copies of books that you don't own. I'm talking about you have a class set and you're just going to take a section and type it out and, and adapt it for the students. This is important. Be sure to make text comprehensible. So if the text is not compelling and it's not comprehensible, then, then you, there's no chance that it's going to engage students. So if it is a text that you find is not necessarily compelling, make sure that it's very, very comprehensible, that students are understanding it as you read it. 
try to connect boring text to interesting activities. So if the text in the, this part of the novel is not very interesting, maybe we're going to do something fun or something with it to try to make it more interesting or the activities we do are going to be more engaging for boring text. And then the other thing is this, if we have to read something that's not engaging and not compelling, then the next time or mixed in with that, we, we want to read uh, interesting things. We want to read something that, that, the, that you create as a teacher that's funny and goofy or really relevant or whatever, because you want to offset that very boring reading with something that's interesting so students don't give up entirely on the idea of reading. I think that's important. It's something I do a lot in class. Sometimes we read things, novels or whatever, that's just not, it's important and students will pay attention to it for a while, but if we do too much of that, then they, they disengage from reading altogether. What kind, going back to this, try to connect boring text to interesting activities. Um, some ideas of things you can do with that is maybe what would you do? So talk, you know, discussion with students about what they would do in certain situations. That's maybe more of an upper level thing. Change the story, take it and make it more interesting. Use actors, you know, readers, theater, those type of things. We'll look at a little bit of that here in a minute. Um, but act things out, maybe combine these two, take actors and change the story to try to make it more interesting. Use images and pictures, that makes it more comprehensible and can make it more interesting. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on here with compelling text is finding a balance between authentic and non-authentic text. Most of the novels we read are going to be non-authentic. And so this maybe just kind of shows us where those fit. I teach level three, four, and five AP Spanish. So I, I like to have an eye on an entire program from, from one to five. And this is what I believe um, happens in each level. And you know, yours won't be exactly like this, but just to kind of see where I see reading fitting in. I think that level one, <clears throat> excuse me, is a lot about learning to communicate. So we're gonna do a lot of non-authentic readings, a lot of stories. There's a lot of good novels for level one, a lot of personalized questions. Level two is learning to communicate better. We might start to do some non-authentic readings, but we're still going to use, I'm sorry, we might start to do some authentic text. We're still going to use a lot of non-authentic readings. We're going to maybe adapt some of those authentic texts. Level three, we're learning to communicate about important topics. So we start to use more authentic text. I still think it's fine to use novels, uh, teacher created novels in level three, but we also start to include then some authentic text, some AP style assessments that are maybe adapted. They're not quite like they'll be on the AP exam. Level four, we're starting to communicate about the world. So we're seeing more and more authentic text, still okay to do some novels, but now more authentic text, uh, adapted AP style assessments. And then level five AP, Lots and lots of authentic sources, lots of authentic reading and, and AP assessments that are like they'll be on the AP exam. Let me check very quickly. Welcome if you're just joining us. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A section. There's also a chat section. Hmm. Uh, let me go on. So the second key here is that our novels be comprehensible. And this is something we do have a little more control over than being compelling. The text must be compelling and it must be comprehensible. Now the first, first idea here is something that's more common or more possible with the text we create, but not impossible with novels. We can adapt text to make them more comprehensible. We can cut out unnecessary parts we can define or summarize ours. Let me show you something here. This is not a novel. This is a reading that we did in class. But again, it's something maybe you could do with part of a novel. So this is something we read in class and you can see I just underlined some parts. I wrote in some English words in there. I adapted that text so my students could read it. So again, maybe I take a section of a novel and if you don't have access to the text digitally, maybe you just type out a section of it and you can adapt it that way to make it more comprehensible. Um, oops. Previewing text is great. So I have a chapter of my book that I'm going to read, but before my students read that actual chapter, we're going to read a preview of that chapter. And I have an example here. This is a new novel of mine that just came out, El Carter, Carterista de Pamplona, the pickpocket from Pamplona. And I have an example, and I put this in English, 
and there you go. I put this in English, but you would do it in Spanish if this, you're reading this book. So we're looking at chapter 14 of this book. Before we read the entire chapter, the students would read this. Arturo and Clara were running hand in hand, leading the procession of frightened tourists and angry bulls. Because all roads were blocked, their only option was to enter the Plaza de Navarra. The first floor of the building was filled with smoke and chaos. Some people were yelling fire, while others yelled bulls. Arturo grabbed the rocket and was headed for the exit when Clara let go of his hand. He was searching for her in the dark with Camilo yelling in his earpiece, Arturo, get out of there and leave her. Arturo was reaching for her when boom. So not only does it start to make it more comprehensible, but it also is a, a kind of interest. It kind of piques that interest of students to go into reading. So they read that, they understand the gist, and then the actual chapter is a little more comprehensible for them which is very similar to the second idea here, which is doing an, uh, what we call an embedded reading. And embedded reading, which I will just very quickly talk about, you can spend lots and lots of time, and some of you, I'm sure lots of you do this, but the idea of an embedded reading is that students will read two or three versions of the text, starting small, until the last version that they read is the end, of, or is, is the actual text. And I have a quick uh, example here with another novel of mine, which is called La Novia Perfecta. And here is, do I have this in English or Spanish? Yeah, this is in English version. I use this for workshops. The, the book is in Spanish. But here is the chapter in English, chapter one of this book, of this novel. So you can see how long it is. And so if I want to make this more comprehensible for my students, and I'm using embedded reading, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a version one. And so for version one, and I marked it in bold here, what would be my version one? I'm just going to take the, the very basic parts of the story or of the chapter that are very comprehensible and can help my students understand the main idea. So chapter one is Miguel Lopez Colon is 27 years old. He was born in Puebla, Mexico. He can speak English and Spanish. He's not happy. He feels very lonely. He needs a girlfriend. He was bored and wanted to go out with a friend. Uh, he got sad because no one wanted to hang out with him and he needed a girlfriend. So, I mean, that you could understand the basics of that chapter just by reading those six or seven sentences. So we'll make sure that that is very comprehensible. Students understand every word of that, every part of that chapter in version one. It, it builds a lot of confidence. It helps students understand, and now they're a little less intimidated when they go into version two or the actual final version. So if I look at version two, and you can do three, four versions if you want, you can do just two. So now here in version two, all my students are gonna see is what was version one in bold, and then in red I added, he speaks Spanish with his family and friends and English with his colleagues. The problem is all his friends have wives and he doesn't have a wife, not even a girlfriend. He wants a wife and many children. And by the way, you the way you create version one and version two is up to you. You might think you want to do less than this or more than this or whatever your students know. He called his friend Benjamin, want to go to the movies with me and see a new Batman movie. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm going to the library with my children to look for books. Mm, he said, you need a girlfriend. I have an idea. Search for a girlfriend on the internet. The internet, that's for losers and old strange men. I don't want to look for women on the internet. He didn't want to look for a woman on the internet. He sat at his computer before searching the internet. He decided to make a list of characteristics he wanted in a girlfriend. He knew the perfect woman existed. He just had to find her. So that would be version two. And then when, after we do that, now we can read the entire chapter and we've thrown in more details, but it's much more comprehensible because we've, we've gone bit by bit. So that is a very quick explanation of, of embedded reading. Um, again, you can spend a lot of time getting into that and doing that maybe even a little differently. Um, a third key here for making text comprehensible is to use visuals to slow down and to ensure comprehension. Sorry, I opened my chat there. So to use visuals to slow down and ensure comprehension. Um, actors, uh, again, reader's theater where we take and we read the dialogue and we act out the action, that can make it more comprehensible because one, students are seeing it as they read, and two, it's making you slow down and spend more time with the text. Another idea is images. I have an example here, and we're gonna watch this as a video in a little bit, but you know, as we're reading through chapter nine, maybe we're projecting some things here to help, or maybe even 
projecting some de definitions, but we're projecting some images to help the students understand what we're reading. And then another thing that I've done is kind of combine these two, act, use actors, act out part of a, a, a text, part of a novel, and then I've have a student be the uh, photographer in class and take pictures as we act out. And then we can take these pictures and then this will give us more exposure to the text, but we can project them in class and retell that chapter of a novel or that part of a reading with the pictures that we took in class. Yeah, that was a, an exciting reading there. Teacher draw, sometimes as we read with the students, I can draw or you could draw as a teacher. Uh, here's an example, this is not from a novel, but here is something that we did in a class once. We were reading, this was actually a short story. Um, and as, as we're reading the different parts, I was drawing it on the board as we went through. This is um, La Continuidad de los Parques, uh, which is kind of a magical realism story, a story within a story. And so it really helped to draw that as we told the story. And your drawings don't have to be great. They just have to kind of show the story as you're going. And again, it will slow you down as you read and draw. And then also having the students draw, a lot of times I will print out something like this for the students, which is just a very simple grid. And I'll tell them, sometimes I'll tell them, all right, pick eight or 10 different parts of that chapter or that story and draw them here. Or I might go into the text and underline certain parts and number them. So this is part one, this is part two, and draw what's happening in that part of the story. So again, that drawing helps them engage, makes it comprehensible for them. And then here's a big part of making the text comprehensible, which is pre-teaching the language. So my students are going to read a book or they're going to read a chapter of a book and there are terms in the book that they don't know yet. So how do we do that? How do we pre-teach the language for the book? And there's, this is what I think is important. When we look at a text, there are four types of unknown vocabulary. There is vocabulary that they don't know, but it's not really that important. There's vocabulary that they don't know, but they can figure out with the context. There's vocabulary that is needed for comprehension. They won't understand this chapter. They won't understand this story if they don't know these words. And then there is vocabulary that is high frequency and valuable for future use. And so not only do they need it to understand the story, but I want them to take this vocabulary from the reading and, and basically internalize it and be able to use it in the future. So there's kind of increasing levels of importance of the vocabulary. So what do we do with these? If vocabulary is not important, we leave it alone and we train students to not worry about it because as they go up and they get into AP, they're always going to fit, even in their first language, they're going to face vocabulary sometimes that they don't know and sometimes it doesn't really matter. We could take it out of the text, uh, we can define it, but usually we're just gonna teach them to understand what they do understand. If it's understood with context, and sometimes these are kind of the same thing, but if it's understood with context, we, we wanna leave it in there because we want them to grow that skill of determining meaning based on context. So we leave it in there, but we check to see how they're doing, and we do some things to kind of develop this skill. Every once in a while when we're doing a reading, and again, this is not a novel, but you could do it with a novel, I'll put something like this on an activity. Using the context, write an English definition for each word found in the story. So these are words maybe they wouldn't know, and so they're going to actually focus on figuring out what the meaning is based on the context. Now, we don't want to do that too much. We want them to use the context to keep reading, but it is a good skill to kind of work on from time to time. If the vocabulary is necessary for comprehension, there are a few things we can do. Define it. I mean, we definitely want to define it. We can define it in the text, we can write the word in there, we can project it on the, on the screen as we're reading, keep it up there. We can define it before we read and students would maybe write notes or maybe just remember, but we wanna make sure we define, we give some meaning to that language before we read it. And then fourth, those high frequency and valuable vocabulary terms for future use, we're gonna do a lot more with, because again, we want students to not only understand it as they read, but also take it with them. So we'll define it and we'll do whatever we can to internalize it. We're 
certainly going to ask personalized questions because that does, goes a long way for internalizing vocabulary. We're going to use it in stories and conversations and whatever. We're going to practice it. We can use things like Textivate or Quizlet Live to practice that vocabulary. And then we're going to reuse it after, um, after we're done with what we read. And then we're going to assess it because again, we want this to go with them and we're you're spending a lot of time with it. So those are the four, when you look at your text and it can be the entire text or it can be a chapter or a section of the text. A lot of times I'll go through a text and I'll have different colored pens and I'll mark vocabulary and I'll, I'll kind of do this. I'll mark one color as not important or understood with context. Don't need to do much with it. I'll mark another color of things I want to define as we read. And then I'll mark another color with valuable for future use. Now the, the, the key here too is that you can't do too much of this because we can't overload students with vocabulary. So sometimes it's a matter of deciding what is most valuable and what am I gonna pull out of there? And I have an, an example from that. And again, this doesn't come from a novel, but you could use it from a novel. This comes from a reading from um, Nuestra Historia Three in Spanish. We read this story about Hurricane Maria and this girl named Natalia who was pregnant and couldn't leave the island and she ended up having her baby during the hurricane. Good story. Uh, but as I looked at that story, or as you look at a, a chapter of a novel, these are the words that I saw that my students wouldn't know, maybe would not know. And you can look there at the Spanish or you can look at the English. So then when I looked at that list, I had to decide which of those were I, I was just going to define and make sure they could understand the reading. And then which of those did I really think was valuable and I, could, I wanted them to know and internalize and take and continue to use. So as you look at that list, and, and it might be different from you, for you based on the students you have or where you're at or what level you have. This is, this is like level three. But what jumps out as you as something that is very useful to take from the reading? Well, when I looked at it, what I took was this. Iba'a was going to. Not necessarily iba yegar, they knew the verb yegar, but it's, very, it's a great phrase to have to be able to say what I was going to do. I was going to do my homework, but I couldn't because I was going to go to the game, but I couldn't because well, that's a very high frequency phrase. So I wanted them to take that from the reading. Embarazada is important. It's also just kind of, for some reason, engaging to students. They love to talk about pregnant people. Ojalá pudiera. Not necessarily we, but uh, I wish I could. That's a, another great phrase. And the thing about this reading and that phrase is students used it for the rest of the year and they continue to use it. It's a very complex phrase, but we saw it like that in this story and we internalized it and we used it a lot and they still use it. And it's so impressive when um, we talk about something coming up, you know, are you going to go to the dance? And someone says, oh, pudiera. I wish I could, but I can't. And then pase lo que pase is another good phrase. So I pulled these four out. We did a lot of things with them. Um, you know, what do you do with them? Well, you can do stories. Again, we're going to do a lot of personalized questions, conversations, situations, uh, classmate search. You know, look for, somebody, look for somebody who was going to do his homework yesterday but didn't. Um, uh, games, drawings, gestures, whatever we can do to internalize that language. Uh, and those were the phrases that I had. What I ended up doing, we did this obviously in Spanish, uh, was that one of the things we ended up doing was doing this, we had to create a conversation uh, where a daughter tells her mom she can't, she was going to do something she can't because she was, because she's pregnant. Mom says, oh, I wish I could help or whatever, and whatever happens, blah, blah. And so they did that, and I did a lot of repeating of it to get the input to help internalize that vocabulary so that when we got to that reading, they could understand it very well. Or when you get to that chapter of the novel, they understand it very well. Uh, there is another example here. Let me open this very quickly. What? I must be sound out of that. That's okay. Uh, and so this, th we're not going to do this here, but this I left in in case you get this presentation and want to check on links later on. There is another example or there's some readings there that you could try to do that with. Again, just important, we have to spend time previewing our text. We must know our students. Um, I wonder why I'm clicking on the Q and A and it's not opening. Any idea why? Let me move on. But Chuck and Aaron, if you want to, any idea why the Q and A is not opening for me when I click on it right now? 
but I will, uh, let's go on to the next part and then we'll see if we can answer some questions at the end. The third key for uh, our reading, there it goes, is that we vary the way in which we read. You can't do the same thing every time. You can't have the whole class read. You can't read individually. You have to change the way you read. And when you look at novels, this is kind of varying the, the way you do the entire novel. There are a few different ways we can approach it. One is that the novel is class, like we're gonna spend the next two weeks on this novel and that's going to be most of our content. That's, we're going to concentrate on that content. Uh, another way is that the novel is part of class and maybe we're gonna spread it out and we're gonna read one chapter every week or every couple weeks or we're gonna do some other things and come back to this novel and kind of spread it out. Good. Uh, there's also a difference between preparing students for the entire novel. So maybe it's near the end of the year and they could comprehend most of it. And so then we can go a little faster with it or preparing students as they go. So maybe we have to spend more time before each chapter. I think it's all of these are fine and I think it's good to vary the way you do the novels. I tend to do this one more. Um, doing just kind of focusing on it for a couple of weeks, but they're all good ways to do novels. Um, there's this article here or this uh, blog post for Teachers Discovery where we taught where I wrote about different ways we can vary reading. And some of these are good to see. Some of them don't apply to novels, but um, read short things, reading long things. So maybe read a short section of the novel at one point, a long section, read aloud, read silently from a page, from a screen with the eyes, with the ears. I'll show you that in a second. Funny text, serious text. Uh, together, separately, in groups, all together as a class, individually, for assessment, for pleasure, in class, at home, teacher-created authentic is, is more for other texts, fiction, nonfiction, again, depends on the text that you have. So whatever you can be doing to change the way you read will help it be a little more engaging and not doing the same thing every time. Another great way to vary delivery is to use screencast. And I talk about this a lot because it's something that I really have found in, to be very valuable in my classes. And I'm gonna throw these on a second because I wanna show you a video. So, oops, sorry. So screencasts are basically you recording your voice over what's on your computer screen, kind of like what we're doing right now. And this is a great thing to do with reading. Uh, okay, Aaron's gonna put the questions in the chat and I, I, will, I think I will be able to see those. So, oh, sorry. So screencasts are a great thing to do with reading because basically it varies the way in which we do it. So I, I can take a chapter, let me show you an example here, and I can basically make a video out of that chapter and then I can use some visuals. First of all, it changes the way I'm doing it. And second of all, I can add some visuals to the reading process. So here's one way we do this. This is with chapter uh, nine through 11 of that Sobrevivientes book. And let me play it for you, hopefully. Los Sobrevivientes, capítulos 9, 10 y 11. Capítulo 9. El hambre, el frío, el silencio, el agotamiento, la falta de esperanza. La cercanía de los cuerpos de los amigos. Las condiciones estaban por vencerles a los sobrevivientes al amanecer del tercer día. Okay, so you can see that my, I'm just reading it and they're kind of seeing it. They're not seeing the text in this one, but I use some images. And then the other thing I did in this one is I, I threw in a video. Done. It's in English. middle of injured brain reading I showed a little video to kind of enhance what they're reading and then it goes back to uh, the text and reading the text pero se podía escuchar later on los 27 sobrevivientes estaban escuchando la okay so that is an example of a screencast let me show you a different one here now this one's a little different because it shows the text so this is them actually reading with me reading. Los Sobrevivientes, capítulos 17 y 18. Con mucho gusto, Antonio los dejo. So we have the text in this one. Tenían que creer que era Chile, su destino. And then I think I included some video in this one too a little bit. Oops, sorry. 
Nope, if that doesn't want to load, that's okay. But you get the idea. They could see the text in that one as well, or in that one instead of just the images like that one. Uh, here's another one from Viva el Toro. If you've read that book before, where the images were helping them just, and this one, they didn't have the text in it. Capítulo 7. Tenía mucho calor. But the images were Julio era understand. muy simpático y guapo. Le gustaba hablar con él acerca de eso, como Juan Cortés. Pero es bueno. Él no está trabajando hoy. So again, it changes the way, it changes the reading, it gives them some images, it helps them out. And then Edpuzzle is something you can do with videos. I know a lot of people have used Edpuzzle. So you can take that video you create and add some activities along with it. Now you'll notice in that one, the audio was a little different. And, and by the way, if you're interested in Screencast, Screencast-O-Matic is what I use. I know Screencastify is a good one. There are lots of Google add-ons. I think to, you can make Screencast pretty easily. Um, it's not really all that difficult. Uh, these links are on here if you want to click on this later on or send me an email if you need help with making Screencast. There's lots of things available online with how to do it. If you've not done it before, it's, it's surprisingly easy and it's really, really effective. Um, and when you do it once, you know, you have it for the next year and you have it for the future. So that helps to vary reading. One thing with screencast, uh, you'll notice again, the, the audio quality, you can do it with your computer microphone, but the more you do it, the more you'll realize that that quality audio is, is helpful. You know, if you're, if you're a student listening to something and it, it's bad quality, it's going to make it hard for you to engage. And so, so um, I have some, I have this microphone I'm using. I have this microphone here, which is a USB microphone that helps um, this thing. Something like this is a pop. I don't know if you can see that, but that's like a pop filter, which I should be using now, but um, it will keep the pop, 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 those sounds out of your, of your audio when you're speaking over it. So Whatever you can do for better audio will make it a little better for your students. But to start off with, just use the, the microphone on your computer um, to record those. Um, another thing, and I kind of mentioned this, is skipping and summarizing. One thing with novels sometimes is that they're long and maybe you don't have the time or you don't want to spend the time reading an entire novel. And I'm sorry if you're an author of a novel and this is offensive, uh, but you can do it with my novels if you want. Um, sometimes, you know, we were reading this one book once and I, I think it was near the end of the year and we just had to hurry up. And so for chapters nine and 10 and 11, I just gave the students a summary of what happened. And then we could move on with chapter 12 and 13 and uh, save a little time that way. And then free voluntary reading. And this is kind of, this is a varied way of reading, um, but it's, it's really a completely different way of reading or silent sustained reading or whatever. The thing with me and, and free voluntary reading that I always had trouble with in the past was that it was time. It, well, we do a lot of reading of other things and then trying to fit in voluntary reading was difficult. And we have very short classes at my school. We have 40 minute classes. And so finding a way to do that. And so what I've done this year is, um, is this. A lot of times in a quarter, students will have to finish one novel. And so the, these, here's the instructions in English. Um, they ha I have this little sheet of paper that they get. And it says, basically, you have to finish a novel by the end of the quarter. And when you finish that novel, you have to fill in this book critique of it. And it's not a lot. It's not hard. The idea here is we want this to kind of be fun and, and light reading for them. And they fill it out. And one side asks them is this it basically has them give a rating and a short description without giving away the ending they basically give their opinion so that other students can see it when they have to select a book and they, we can start to build this collection of reviews so they can decide which books they might like you know if my friend that's similar to me likes this book then maybe i'll like this book the back part asks them to do a little bit more of telling the plot they can give away the ending so that when i hang up this picture this paper in the classroom, students will see one side that doesn't spoil the ending and not the other side, which was for me as a teacher to read. So now when we finish a quiz or we finish something they're working on in class, then it can be time for them to do FER. Now we also, I also will, will dedicate time to that in class as well, but uh, it's made it, I've, I've liked the way it's gone so far. Um, doing that free voluntary reading like that with the students. One of the keys to free voluntary reading is that when students are reading, the teacher should be reading too, not doing other work, not doing other things, but, but modeling that idea of reading with the students. Again, this is a large topic that you can spend a lot of time talking about, 
but it's one of those things where students, if they have um, choice on the books that they're reading, it can be a little more engaging for them. The key there then too is to, to build up a classroom library, which takes some time, but over time it's, it's good to, to get some books for students to read. And then the, um, we can vary what, how we deliver reading with varying assessment, sometimes for pleasure, sometimes for review, sometimes we do simple comprehension questions. Uh, sometimes we'll do that old fashioned, uh, we're gonna read chapter seven, and after we read that you have a quiz and you won't be able to use the text, so make sure you pay attention. Yeah, that's, that's fine to do every once in a while. We use Otis at our school, which is digital. You can use Google Forms. Uh, we can do comprehension activities. This is one that I've liked doing recently, which is cause and effect. So, and this was part of a quiz here, but uh, this, something like this, I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, but fill in some causes and students have to write in the effect. So this happened and what resulted? This happened, what resulted? This resulted, what caused it? And it's, it's simple and it's, it's a, but it's a little bit of writing and it, you know, there's some kind of options for what students can write, but they have to understand the story to do it. They have to be able to use the language well to do it. You could simplify it if you're in level one and reading a simple book, um, but cause and effect. Uh, and, oh, and then writing or speaking extensions after reading, writing from a different point of view, writing a new ending, writing what happens next, having characters interview, and you can do that orally, you can do that in writing as well. Um, simultaneous acting is where, you know, we use actors sometimes in class where we have a few people come up and demonstrate in front of the class for reader's theater. The other thing you can do with reading is make everybody an actor. So if I have a text that we read and there are three characters, I'm gonna put all my students into groups of three and one person, I have this example here, again, not from a novel, but you could do it with a novel. So one person is going to be Amy and one person is going to be Doug and one person is going to be the doll in the story that we read. And then we read the story and I have it projected here, but you could just read it and everybody's acting it out at the same time. So we call that simultaneous acting. And just in their groups, they're just acting. They don't really need to talk. They're just acting out the parts of the story. There's a couple examples of that you can see if you want this. Another one is an art museum where you take parts of a text and you assign it to groups and they have to draw a picture that represents that part of the text. And then you hang those pictures around the classroom and students walk around in pairs or groups and they describe in the target language what was happening or what is happening in that picture. We call this gallery rock walk, gallery walk sometimes or art museum. Um, and then you can take those pictures and scan them and use them for retells of the reading. We can play some games with the reading. This, this one, uh, this game, I call La Cuchara because we use a spoon. You put a spoon between the two students, you ask them comprehension questions, or you, or you tell them true and false statements about the book. And if it's true, they have to grab the spoon. If it's false, they can't touch the spoon or the other student gets a point. Um, I can explain that in more detail if you want later on. But simple games like that with comprehension. Uh, we've talked about Textivate and Ed Puzzle. You can do some translating with reading if you want from time to time, I think it's okay. We don't wanna to do too much of that though. And then assessment, uh, very quickly, and again, assessment can be a big thing, but let's very quickly talk about assessment. Some of it we've kind of already seen. Again, I really think that making students want to engage is more important than trying to find ways to hold them accountable. But um, we do wanna hold them accountable sometimes. And I also believe this, because I get a lot of questions about how do you assess reading? How do you assess reading? How do you assess reading? I think that if, if students are buying into this idea and we're really promoting this idea that everything has a purpose, then when we assess writing and speaking, we are assessing reading because reading and listening are how they're getting their input and how they're growing their skills. And so when we are, reassess something that they write or say, we can really try to remind them that if you're able to write well and, and speak well, it's because you've been reading and listening. Um, but we also use, we also do comprehension, again, Google Forms. This thing is something that I have available for the one novel and we're working on a new one um, where we, this is an individual comprehension assessment, which has something that goes with every chapter. So that may be if a student is reading that, maybe an independent study student or a student's reading and, and you wanna do something more 
you have something for every chapter and we kind of vary it sometimes english sometimes spanish sometimes true or false sometimes complete the sentence or whatever um we do Ooh, this is good if you're an upper level teacher and you're doing comprehension questions it's a good idea to have a bank of common questions from AP or common forms of questions. So even if it's a, a novel that's teacher created, you start to get students used to seeing questions formed in the way they'll be formed on the AP test. If you are an AP teacher or you have an AP teacher in your department, they'll be very happy uh, if you do that. And, and then sometimes we do questions in English to really check comprehension. Most often we do questions in the target language. Um, we talked about speaking and writing a second ago, offering multiple prompts, character interviews, changing point of view, what happens next, changing the ending, and engage you with that. Okay, so that is, let me get to the questions here in a second, but thank you very much uh, for that. Again, it's kind of a quick run through on some of that. I do want to mention, as I've kind of shamelessly done throughout the presentation, the novels that I have available, they are all in Spanish. Uh, La Novia Perfecta is about a, a young man who meets a girl on the internet in the Dominican Republic and goes to meet her and finds out that it's not what he thought it was. Uh, Bajo el Agua is about a young man in, Co in Costa Rica. If you know anything about the volcano Arenal and the Lake Arenal and the cities that were, that were submerged under the water when they created the lake and some kind of some ghosts and things that appear from those cities buried under the water. Sobrevivientes is about the plane crash and the, the rugby team from Uruguay surviving and then Carterista de Pamplona is about a young man in Pamplona who is a pickpocket. And, and we learn a lot about San Fermin and running of the bulls and everything that goes on for those festivities as he is engaged in a uh, kind of the crime of the century in Pamplona. Okay, so let me see if I can get to some questions here and answer them. And again, I thank you so much for being here. Let me see um, what questions I can get to here. Meg says, I see that you're addressing Spanish three. I teach beginning Spanish to Spanish one with a huge variety of ability you know, from native speakers to novice. Uh, is what you're addressing apl applicable to those levels as well? I think a lot of it is, uh, some of it is not, some of the examples maybe were higher level, but a lot of those things, making things comprehensible and compelling and varying the way you do it, I think that applies to every le level. How many novels do you present to your AP students? I feel like I do not have time for novels other than articles. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons I went to this um, FVR, free voluntary reading, where students are doing that usually when they're done with a quiz or test or other activity. And then the other thing about that is if they don't get that done in the quarter, uh, then they may have to take a, check out a book and take it home to finish it. But that is certainly something that I dealt with. And that's one of the reasons that doing those individual novels uh, between other things has been helpful for that. Okay, good. What do you recommend when you have students with very different levels in the same class? Reading is a great way to differentiate our instruction. Now, one of the now novels, you know, novels are fixed, and maybe if we're all reading the same novel, we can't differentiate that. One of the ways we can do that is have students reading different novels. Now, maybe that applies to you, maybe it doesn't, but it, some students will read easier novels, some students will read harder novels. The other thing you can do is that embedded reading, you can embed more for students who are not as strong and less for students who are stronger. You can also adapt to what you do, how you interact with the text. So maybe students who are stronger are going to do more writing extension and students who are weaker are going to do more comprehension. But reading, and if you have administrators who really want to see differentiation in your instruction, reading is a great way to do it because, again, they can be reading different things or interacting in different ways. Will a recording be available of this? Yes, it will. Yep, that's already been answered. Uh, will there be access to slides and links afterwards? Yes, we are going to provide that. Oh, there it is. Yeah, we're going to post them on, on YouTube and on Facebook so you can have these slides and um, click on the links. Do you teach grammar along with the novels or do you use what comes up in context? Um, kind of both. Yes, I do teach grammar as it comes up in context. I think. Oh, I see what you're saying. Do I pre-teach the grammar? Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes both. It depends on the novel, depends on what else we're doing. Sometimes I'll pre-teach the grammar 
before it comes up and we'll do a lot. And it's basically that same idea as with any structure. If I want them to internalize it and take it and use it afterwards, then we'll spend a lot of time with that beforehand. If not, then maybe we won't spend as much time and I'll just make sure they can understand it. I hope that answers that question. Okay, do we have any other questions here? I'll give one second if you wanna add one more question here. Looks like oh, about nine o'clock, so we're getting done to just about an hour. Aaron is posting some things about um, professional development certificate. And again, I appreciate your attention, especially if you're on the East like me and it's the end of a long day of teaching and, and a long night. Uh, what do you recommend for low level reading as far as what books to read? What, um, you know, Aaron may be able to answer that a little better. I, again, teaching only levels three, four, and five, I don't have as much experience with those novels. I know there are a ton of novels for low level reading. Um, and so you can look into some of the ones that are good there. Mm, a lot of times you can find samples or buy sample packs and then you can read them and start to see what fits well with your students. Look for things that are culturally uh, strong and relevant for students and that kind of pique their interest. Do you have recommendations for German readers? No, I'm sorry, I don't. And do you have anything for Berto and sus Buenos Amigos? Sorry, I do not have anything for those as well. Um, if you're a German teacher, maybe you can suggest some things to read or maybe you can write some things to read um, for that. And yeah, there's also some short stories you can read. And again, we focused on novels here tonight, but a lot of this applies to reading in general, things you can apply. And when it's not a novel, sometimes you can create things on your own that are, you know are very compelling and comprehensible for your students. And um, it's not necessarily a novel, but it can work very, very well. Novel reading is part of what we do, but we do lots of different type of reading. Again, it's, it's I believe strongly in the power of reading. We're, we're really reading things every day. We're reading lots, we're reading significantly three or four times a week. And um, I, I just, I, it, I find it very valuable. I try, try, not every student buys in, but I try to get students to understand how important it is so that they can read. So again, make sure things are compelling, make sure it's comprehensible, vary the way you do it, and then and try to get students to engage with it. I will give one more second for a couple more questions here, and then Aaron or Chuck, if there's anything else you think we need to do, we can do that. If not, we will be having a good night. I still have problems, someone says I still have problems on what to do after the reading. If you want to send me an email, Mercedes, um, or maybe with some specific questions or some things, maybe I can help you with that. Because um, we did go through kind of quickly on, on those and I can give you some ideas on activities to do after the reading. So thank you so much for your attention. And I hope that you're able to make it back. I know that Voces has a lot of these webinars set up some very, very good, interesting topics. Again, thank you so much to Aaron and Chuck for providing these for us. I know I will be taking advantage of watching as many of them as I can and hope you all have a great night.